Good morning. Something to ponder today is a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. True compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It comes to see that an edifice, a structure, which produces beggars needs restructuring. Welcome. For thousands of years, Indigenous people have walked in this land on their own country. Their relationship with the land, with the land is at the center of their lives. We acknowledge the Chippewa, Iroquois, and Algonquin people, past and present, for their stewardship of this land throughout the ages. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. As we settle into this sacred place, put away the pressures of the world that ask us to perform, to take up masks, to put on brave fronts. Silence the voices that ask you to be perfect. This is a community of compassion and welcoming. We bring all that we are and all that we yet can be to this safe and sacred place. God's steadfast love extends to the heavens, God's faithfulness to the clouds, God's righteousness is like the mighty mountains, God's judgments are like the deep, the great deep. How precious is your steadfast love, O God! All people may take refuge in the shadow of God's wings. They fast, they feast on the abundance of God's house and drink from the river of God's delights. God is the fountain of life. In God's light, we see the light. Come, let us worship. Let us pray. Holy One, beginning with your wind, sweeping over the face of the waters. You created the world. Through the waters you brought your people up out of Egypt. 
and sent your spirit over the waters at Jesus' baptism. And you revealed the nature of Jesus' ministry when Jesus transformed water into wine. You speak and all creation bends and blooms. Help us listen with the attentiveness of the waters and help us see the new work you are beginning in our midst as we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Good morning. Our scripture lesson this morning is uh, taken from the book of Luke, chapter 4, verses 21 through 30. And this is a passage that I think many will recognize. It's an account of where Jesus has returned to Nazareth to teach in the synagogue. And it's actually before a hometown crowd. And initially the people were very supportive and they they were very close to his message. But actually then he begins to explain what his ministry is. And they see things differently. He's suggesting that his, his ministry is for both Jew and Gentile. And it's there that they see he hasn't performed as they thought he should. And so we will read. And he began by saying to them, Today... This scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this pro proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. I tell you the truth, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time, when the sky was shut out for three and a half years, and there was a severe famine. And yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath, in the region of Sidon. And there, many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha, the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Nahum, the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they had heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of a hill on which the town had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. But he walked through the crowd and went on his way. We have a second reading today, and this one is very well known, of course, to many, I'm sure. And it is uh, 1 Corinthians, is the chapter, and verses 1 through 13. Now, the context is important. The preceding chapters that Paul wrote detailed many difficulties that the church in Corinth were having. And so the reading that we have here is a corrective that's given to the people of Corinth, hoping to bring about a change. And so we read a very familiar, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. If I give all my possessions to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, 
it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection, as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Well, once again, we are uh, joining with uh, Tom Watson in his uh, uh, invitation to come into his town. It's called Our Town, and we've been there before in the last few weeks. And it's important that we join in now because it's been a busy week in our town, especially these past few days, because it's the time of year, I guess, when the days are getting a bit longer and there's a little bit more light, all of which seems to give people a touch more energy that they had in those darker, dreary days of earlier January. In fact, some people had so much energy this week that they were out looking for things to do. Fred Bowers went outside Friday morning to find his next door neighbor, Hank Vickers, leaning on his snow shovel in the driveway. What's up, Hank? asked Fred. Oh, I just thought I'd come out here and be ready in case it snowed, replied Hank. Is there snow in the forecast, Hank? Uh, not sure, Fred. I didn't hear the weather this morning, but I wouldn't mind if we had a little so I could, well, get to use this new shovel that I bought. Seems to me, Hank, it was only a few weeks ago you were complaining like all get out about having to shovel so much snow. And now here you are praying for it. Well, sure, replied Hank, but, but that was before I went down to Casey's Hardware and bought these, this, this new fangled shangle shovel. It, it's got a curved handle. You know, I've been on the hunt for a great shovel ever since I stopped blowing snow years ago. And I tell you, Fred, this baby is something. I can't wait to use it. Well, look, Hank, said Fred, I'm not sure I understand. But if we were to get the snow that you're praying for, and you finish your driveway, and are still hankering to do a little bit more, please feel free to go to my driveway as well. As for me, I'm going down to Al's for morning coffee. When Fred got to Al's to have his coffee with the other older guys, he told everybody about Hank. Maybe, said Jack Cameron, I should get my pickup and load her up with some snow and, and I've got lots at my place and take it down and dump it on Frank's driveway so he'll have something to practice on. God knows I've got lots of it and I really wish I could give it away. And everybody had a good chuckle at, Frank, at Hank Vickers' expense. Willie Flugel, from over at the Church of the Reluctant Apostle, he came in sometime during the discussion. He finally spoke up and said, Well, boys, speaking from a theological perspective, it's just an indication of humanity's social and sinful nature. Pastor Willie doesn't usually talk theology during the morning coffee, but for some reason he did on Friday. Probably he just drifted off into working on Sunday morning sermon. The rest of the old guys looked a bit puzzled. And so Willie continued, What I mean is that people are never satisfied. 
It's either too hot or it's too cold or we've had too much rain or it's too dry or there's not snow or, and maybe we've had too much of it. No matter what God gives them, things never really are quite right. Or maybe they just like to complain. Well, Willie, you know me, said Bill Partlow. I'm not much of a churchgoer, so I'm obviously no expert on the sinful nature that you spoke of. And certainly I don't mean to complain, but there are a lot of things that I'm not really satisfied with these days. Oh, like what, Bill? Pastor Willie said. Well, mostly it's the things our new council is doing. Sometimes I wonder who elected them anyway. Especially that mayor of ours, Jim Stacy. Seems to me I remember you campaigning for Jim Stacy, said Bert Morgan. Yes, Bert, I know. I did. But it's downright obvious that I made a mistake. Did you hear what they did at their meeting on Monday night? And it was mostly Jim Stacy's idea. I sure won't be campaigning for him next election. Yeah, said Charlie Baker. And Toronto thinks they got it bad with Mel Lastman. And the old guys talked on for a while about the dumb decisions that their town council was making. When Frank Burstead went home for lunch, he told Myrtle about the morning's conversation. Myrtle rocked back and forth in her rocking chair for a bit. And then she said, Well, Franklin, it seems to me it must be awfully hard to be on council. And knowing that no matter what you do, you'll be lucky if you can please half of the people. Council decisions, seems to me, are a lot like the weather. No matter what happens, somebody will complain that they're not satisfied. Yeah, I guess you're right, Bert, replied Frank. We elect people because we thought that they would do everything the way we wanted them to. But then they don't. And right then we start figuring out how to get rid of them and put somebody else in their place. Getting elected is only half the battle, Franklin. It's a long and sometimes lonely road that you have to walk after that. Well, that's the news from our town this week, at least from the stories that I've heard. And then Tom takes us to another time and another place. Jesus is back home in Nazareth at worship in the synagogue in which he grew up. And they gave him the scroll to read and it was from the book of Isaiah. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. Hear it again. All spoke well of him until he interpreted what the words of Isaiah meant. And then they were filled with rage. They got up and drove him out of town to the brow of a cliff so that they might hurl him off. They spoke well of him until he said something they disagreed with. Jesus never ran for election, but he certainly knew what it meant to have people praise him one minute and seek his death the next. And how quickly it turns from, oh, that's our boy, Joseph's son, into, who in the world does he think he is? Do you know what the biggest danger is in moving away from home? It's something that Jesus discovered that day in the synagogue in Nazareth. When you move away, you change. But people back home still remember you from back then. They expect that you still have the same values and the same outlooks and the same prejudices that you used to have, which incidentally are the same values and outlooks and prejudices that they have. And when they find out that you look at things differently, they will hate you. Deep down, they may know that you're right, but they will still hate you. We're talking about dealing with life situations. Today's situation 
is one that every person who gets elected to public office knows. And every person who takes any leadership responsibility all know. And sometimes it's something that Jesus knew all too well. The daily battle over our convictions, our identity, and our values, and our very selves and souls. Who are you? Do you know what it means to have to stand tough for your convictions and your values and your identity? Do you know what it means to have other people criticize you and maybe speak very badly about you because you don't see the things they think you should? What do you do in the face of criticisms? What do you do with the angry letter that you might receive in the mail? What do you do with the angry crowd that maybe wouldn't go as far as running you off a cliff, but they'd certainly be pleased to see you leave town and not come back? And from the other side of the coin, what do you do when we disagree with our elected representatives or leaders in any capacity for that matter? Are we quick to criticize or are we more reasoned in our approach? Have we ever sat down and written a letter in anger and at a later time thought in a more reflective moment, you know, I could have been more considerate or more respectful. I still think I had a valid point to make, but I might have done it differently. I might also have considered that there is another point of view. And how about the way we approach the teachings of Jesus, asks Tom. Do we, perchance, ever do the same as the people in the synagogue in Nazareth that day, hanging on his every word as long as it sits well with us, but discounting him completely when he says things that we don't want to hear? C.S. Lewis once mused that dogs and cats should be raised together because it broadens their minds so. I think we tend to forget that there are always other points of view. We need to stand for something, yes, to hold clearly thought out values and principles, but we also need to remember that others stand for something too, that they too have clearly thought out values and principles. Sometimes I wonder, says Tom, if I am so absolutely sure about something, if the truth is so blindingly clear to me, why is it that everyone else doesn't get it? Why are they still in the situation of being so badly off the mark? Tom writes a note of humility to himself. So here's the interconnection for all of us. Three things that we should keep in balance. First, the need to have solid personal convictions and not to allow other people to make us over into something that we are not. And secondly, the need to remember that no matter how firmly held our convictions, there are other points of view. And surprise, surprise, our opinions are not always right. And thirdly, the need to find the way to live together in harmony with all of the wonderful mix of people and the points of view that are among us. Maybe this latter point is the reason that we have church. That we might discover the way to meld together the wonderful mix into positive, cohesive force that works together as the body of Christ. This morning, our other reading was the beautiful love chapter from the writings of Paul. The words are so often read at weddings because they're so profoundly beautiful, so poetic, and so laden with emotion. But, like all other scripture, we need to remember not only the words, but the context in which they were originally written. For behind the beautiful words of poetry lies the message that Paul 
was delivering to the people in the church at Corinth. Look, folks, I can't believe you're treating each other this way. And for heaven's sake, you call yourself a Christian community. You see, the words were written as a corrective to what was happening in their congregation. The church was in turmoil. Weekly worship services were a disaster. The whole business about whose spiritual gift was the best and had nearly brought people to blows with one another. Some people were excluded from communion. Others had filed suits against each other. If you read the first 12 chapters of the book of Corinthians, you see all the disputes that Paul tried to settle. And now he says, look, I will offer you a corrective. Strive to be a community in which love perseveres. Perseveres. It's not a word you'd find on a Valentine's Day card. But in the end, love is the only one thing that survives. And along with the three things together, along with faith and hope, it will last. Love is the only thing that will take us the distance. Dogs and cats should be raised together. It broadens their minds so. Because when we look toward each other with love, we will discover that each of us, no matter how similar or how different, no matter whether we share the same values and opinions or not, we each are bearers of the image of God. Amen. Stop.
sun come in and shine. I want to walk beyond the boundaries where I've never been before. Throw open doors to worlds outside the Theological education provides a roadmap to vitality. Vancouver School of Theology just celebrated its 50th anniversary. The school, which receives support through mission and service, has thrived for over half a century thanks to your generosity. We are committed to serve and support the church, says Vancouver School of Theology President and Vice Chancellor Richard Topping. To that end, the school has big plans for the coming year to expand facilities in order to create more teaching space for its growing student body, to begin new partnerships and to invest in helping congregations flourish. Many congregations struggle with issues of vi viability. For example, managing and maintaining buildings, paying for staff and other related expenses. Through our congregation, Congregation of Viability through Community Engagement Project, we want to help communities of faith refocus on core principles of church health and begin to explore new ways of becoming a thriving church, says Topping. Right now, through the Congregational Vitality Initiative, Vancouver School of Theology is working hard to identify the challenges that congregations are facing and help them see what the future might look like. As the research unfolds, Vancouver School of Theology will gather the best resources and practices that lead to congregational vitality and making them available to the whole church. With proven resources in hand, congregations will be equipped to become more healthy and vital. For communities of faith that are struggling or need extra support, the school plans to offer hands-on support. Your gifts are crucial to the work of our school. It is a source of encouragement to our work during these days when the whole of our operations is online because of COVID-19 restrictions. Through the hard work and dedication of staff, faculty and student body, who not only work hard but also care deeply, we have been able to continue keeping our calling to educate and form thoughtful, engaged, and generous Christian leaders for the church and the world in the 21st century, says Topping. Thank you for your gifts through mission and service. By supporting theological education, you will ensure not only that the church has strong leaders, but also equip them and the whole of the church with a roadmap to vitality too. Thank you. Prayer of dedication. We come together to thank God for our blessings and to offer our gifts so that the ministry of this church will continue to grow. Thank you for sharing your gifts. We offer them to God in gratitude and praise. Merciful one with grateful hearts, we offer these gifts, asking that they might be transformed into compassion for our world, hope for all who struggle, and vision of for our ministry. As this is an online venue, we do not say names during our prayers of the people. However, if you have someone that you would like included, please contact Sue by message, email or phone, and she will do this. In joy and in sorrow, we do not walk alone. So we take the flame and light this candle, this care candle. God of creation, God of a new creation, you are our salvation and we pray for your restoration for many this day. For those who mourn, weep and gnash teeth, may your joy be their strength. For those who are weary, worn out and discouraged, May your spirit give their lives new purpose. 
for those who live under threat of violence, may your sheltering arm console and shield. For those who hunger and thirst, may your abundance be shared freely among the haves and the have-nots. You have shown us your glory now. Let us go out into your world and show your glory in our words and deeds. We pray in the name of the one who taught us how to pray and provide for one another. Amen. In all experiences and encounters, may you find the compassion of God. In all changes and choices, may you find the wisdom of God. In all reflection and response, may you find the hope of God. In all hearts and homes, may the peace of God be with you. Amen. Gladness, God's radiant 